In the name of Jesus. Amen. Life is messy. That's the way of it. That's the way of relationships. That's the way of life. That's the way of death. If you want to know how a family functions, look at them at the point of death. What happens to brothers and sisters at the death of a parent? What happens to parents at the death of a child? Oh, the worst in us tends to come out at that point. And so we give a little bit of grace, if you will, to Mary Magdalene and Peter and John, as well as the rest of the disciples this morning, for exactly how they respond in the face of death. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb along with the other women. She is expecting full well to find Jesus' body there, a body that's bloody, gory, and beginning to stink. But when she arrives at the tomb with the other women, he's not there. And so, in disbelief, she runs off to the disciples to tell them that Jesus' body has been snatched. Somebody took it. Somebody stole it. Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, run to the tomb. And, like two brothers, I suppose we wonder which one's going to get there first. Not that John then pulls this out too much in his own gospel, but he does just enough as if it's sticking it to Peter, right? I got there first, and what did I see? Not much, except that it didn't look like a grave robbery. For there were not only the cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' body, but also that face cloth. And it's folded up of all things as if someone carefully prepared their bed in the morning and set everything to rights. And so, Peter and John believe. What exactly is it that they believe? That Jesus' body is gone. For John goes on to note they didn't yet believe in the resurrection of the dead. And if you come here today not believing in the resurrection of the dead, as Paul notes, the faith that you have is in vain. Or if you believe that the Christian faith is for this life alone, then you are most to be pitied. For a moral life does benefit your neighbors. It is good to love them. But that love only goes so far. Because life is messy. And like it or not, though we try our best to be on our best behavior, sin happens. In spite of our self-control, in spite of our desire. And then, of course, there are the sins that happen on purpose, that we want to do, that we think will make life better, but in fact, just make life far messier, far more painful, far worse. Look at the scars in Jesus' body and know precisely how messy life and sin are. Mary comes back after the disciples have gone to their homes. She is going to continue the search. It's not enough to know that Jesus' body is gone. She wants to take it and rightly prepare it. This is love. Love that bears all things, endures all things, hopes all things. Well, pretty close anyway. And so she will sacrifice her time for the sake of her Lord. She continues her search, but she finds something very unusual in the tomb. Two angels there in white sitting where the body of Jesus had laid, one at the head and one at the feet. And the the angels then say to her, why are you weeping? By the way, boys, it's always good advice not 
to go around asking a woman, why are you weeping condescendingly? Or in any way other than to really inquire what is at the heart of her pain and suffering. That's an act of love. I think we should look at the angel's words in this way. They're not trying to prod her out of her mourning. They want to know what it is that her heart seeks. She says to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And then she turns and she goes. Now keep in mind that the angel did already proclaim the first time she came to the tomb that Jesus had risen and he's going before the disciples to Galilee. But do you see what sorrow does? It rips away at the words of Jesus from our hearts. It takes comfort from us. Because what do our eyes see in the face of death? A grave. Not only for the people we lay in there, but for us. Life is messy. And it seems that the only way out is to go down into the dirt. Mary, turning around, goes back out into the garden, and there is Jesus. Finally, her Jesus, there to greet her, there to comfort her. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Are you seeking the Jesus that died, who was crucified and laid into the grave and no longer breathes? Or are you seeking the Jesus who lives, the Jesus who comes into the messiness of your lives, the death and the sin and the stink and the rot to come and give you life and forgiveness and restoration? That's the solution to our brokenness. Reconciliation by Christ, not only with God the Father, but with one another. Who is it that you seek today? Do you seek the Jesus who was swallowed up by the grave and seemed to be swallowed up forever, whose body was missing? Or do you seek the Jesus who is risen from the dead? who lives and reigns to all eternity, who doesn't play hide and seek with you today, but instead says, here's my body, here's my blood. Come and eat and drink because on the last day, I will eat up death for you. I will swallow it. Death shall be no more because in my death, I have swallowed death. My life is now liberating, freeing you. Whom are you seeking? The Jesus that you seek today is the Jesus that you hold fast to by faith. Is that Jesus the dead Jesus? Or the Jesus who is risen? Mary supposes him to be the gardener. She is in part right. He is the better Adam the one who restores the creation. She responds, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. She keeps on loving Jesus to the end. Nothing will dissuade her. And yet she does not see by faith who is before her. How true of our own lives. There's Jesus right before us, ready to change things once again. We're blind to the truth. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Because Jesus said to her, Mary. He called her by name. And she knows by faith, this is her risen Lord. And so she comes and she worships him. 
She delights in him. She rejoices in him, which is actually why you are here so early in the morning, even before the sun has risen. Maybe as you were driving to church this morning, you were able to look up in the sky and see the full moon. But the sun will break soon. Light will return soon. Suddenly. About 7.05, so only about 35 minutes away. And when the light returns, there's joy. It breaks suddenly sometimes. That's the nature of joy. It's not something that comes in oftentimes gradually. Instead, it's that moment when you see your loved one getting off the plane or the train and you, you run for them. Well, you can't do that anymore at an airport, but probably at a train station you can. It's that moment when you come out of surgery and you know that all things went well for your beloved. It's that moment when your child comes into the world and he's delivered safely. There is joy. Mary has joy. She's, she falls down, it seems, at Jesus' feet and she's clinging to him. She's just holding on to his legs like maybe a little child holds on to your legs not wanting you to leave the house. Just stay for a little while longer. Don't go to work, Mom. Don't go to work, Dad. I love you. And Jesus responds, do not cling to me. Now that's kind of interesting, isn't it? I, I know I've, I've said that to my own children, not quite in that, that wording, but hey, I've got to go to work. Uh, don't keep holding on to me. It just makes it really hard to get out the door with you shackled to my leg. And yet Jesus is not giving an order or command here. It comes across as an imperative like clean your room or go to work. But instead, this is more like don't continue to cling to me. It's an imperfect. And Jesus says, don't continue to cling to me, at least not physically. You can cling to me in a better way. Not by holding on to my legs or my feet, but instead holding fast to me by faith. For life is messy. And you need somebody to come along and clean things up, clean you up. That's what he did in the waters of holy baptism. He called you by name. And when he did so, he said, you are mine. Nothing that you're going to do in this life is going to cause me to leave you. I will always hold on to you. Always hold fast to you. Keep calling you by name. And then he says the most surprising we don't find it all that surprising. He says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. You've heard that all of these years. Those of you who have attended this service, the other service, 8 and 11 a.m., they don't get the same gospel. Poor Christians. What blessed words we have here. But sometimes our ears become numb to things. Kind of like when your husband says to you each day, I love you. You're like, yeah, I know. No, 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 no. I love you. You're my world, my beloved. And so these words, we must ponder them for a moment. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Here Jesus doesn't say, I'm ascending to my Father, but he's not for you. You messed up. You don't deserve this. You didn't hold fast to my promise because I said, I will rise from the dead. So this God, this Father, isn't for you. This is not the message he passes along to the disciples who abandoned him, who really messed it up, right? No, instead he says, my father is your father. My God is your God. This is how Jesus deals with us, with our broken lives. This is how deals, Jesus deals with us in our sin. He comes along and restores us once again. Brings us back into the family. For here's the thing about family. You're kind of stuck with them. 
And sometimes we look at that and we say, oh, really? I'm stuck with that brother for the rest of my life? Yes, Ethan, you are. And that's a blessing. God has placed you together in family. So also in this church as family. So also in the greater church as family. That's why we're gathered around here hearing the family's stories being strengthened once again in the faith. Oh, it's tempting to walk away. But that's not the way Jesus handles things. Nor is it the way we should. When you have conflict with your brother, your parents keep telling you to work it out. And when that doesn't work, they come along and help you to work it out. Because you're stuck together for life and in the life which is yet to come. And so feast this day. Feast together in brotherhood and friendship and love in the messiness of life and take comfort for Christ comes once again restoring you. And finally, go forth like Mary Magdalene. We've heard the Lord. We've seen him. And God be praised, he restores us once again this day. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.